Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, a story in which an innocent woman is brutally and violently bludgeoned to death by her own community for really no good reason. What exactly is Jackson trying to tell us? I'm Dr. Whitney Costers, and I have been an English instructor for the last 17 years at um, a couple of community colleges and state universities. And I love my job so much, and I enjoy the discussions that I have with my students to such an extent that I thought it would be really fun to bring those lectures and discussions to you and have a wider cultural conversation about these very well known and often um, canonical texts. So today we're going to talk about the lottery and before we actually get into the text itself, I want to talk about traditions um, because as you can tell if you've read the story, this story um, centers on the notion of traditions, the usefulness or the total uselessness of following them, and the questioning of their value to society and to the individual. So when I teach this story to my students, I always ask them to think of a tradition that has been um, long standing in their community or in their family, and I ask them to share it. So I have been um, very lucky to have learned about a number of traditions that I had never even heard of, um, you know, prior to teaching this short story. And, you know, there are a few that I can mention very quickly. Um, you know, some students mention the um, Three Kings Day, during which um, they celebrate um, the, co the coming of the Three Kings to Jesus by baking this this purple and green um, cake, and inside is a little plastic um, Jesus figurine. And so the cake is cut up, and then everyone is excited to see, um, you know, who got the plastic Jesus. And um, there have been, you know, a variety of interpretations on this tradition. Um, some communities and cultures, they say that the person who, um, you know, got the Jesus in, in their cake. They get to be king for a day. Um, sometimes it's not as exciting. Like, I guess you're on the hook for like paying for the next party that this family or this community has. Um, so it, it just sort of depends on how the community wants to, to honor that tradition. Um, and let's see, another tradition is of course, Passover. Um, I've had students talk about that. Um, I've had people talk about um, how, you know, some some cultures will um, take their suitcase on New Year's Eve, or it might be New Year's Day, one of the two, and, and they pack it and then they run around the, the block, the neighborhood. Um, and if you're too embarrassed to do that, because you're, you're kind of nervous that people are gonna think you're um, out of your mind just running around with a suitcase. Um, I guess you can, um, according to a student of mine, you can run around the house seven times really fast and achieve the same purpose. And that purpose is that, you know, you most likely will get to travel prosperously um, in that new year. Um, Another tradition that, you know, of course, uh, that I did um, that doesn't sound unusual to me because I'm so familiar with it is, you know, my parents always took us to see the Easter Bunny every Easter. We would get a picture with him. Um, so uh, I'm thinking of um, what are some other traditions that people had shared with me? Um, there's a Korean tradition, I believe, um, that says that on the baby's, a baby's first birthday, you are to lay out, um, you know, various um, props that can represent um, uh, career choices. So you might have like a stethoscope for a doctor, or you could have um, a hammer for a construction worker, and then you watch and see what the baby gravitates toward, and that will, um, determine or at least suggest what that baby will become when he or she grows up. Um, so I have students share as many traditions as possible. And what I always ask them is, 
Do you know why you do this? Do you know what the origins of this tradition are? And I have to tell you that I would say 80% of them, maybe 75% of them say, I have no idea why we do this. My mom, she, my mom, my grandmother, my dad, it's very important to them. It's what we've always done. Um, I just go with it because it's, I don't know, it's just what we do. And I have to tell you that, you know, I did the same thing as, um, as a child, as a young adult. Um, I didn't question a lot of the things that we did as traditions. I mean, how utterly strange and bizarre that my parents want me to sit on the lap of this like, you know, six foot um, tall bunny to celebrate, um, you know, the the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. I just, I think because I had been doing it for so long and as a young child when I didn't question things, it just seemed very normal to me. But I can completely understand how if you're outside of that tradition and it's very foreign to you, these, these traditions can seem very weird, right? Like, why are you running around the neighborhood with your suitcase or why are you sitting on this you know oversized bunny's lap or why are you putting like all of these you know strange props around this baby um so you know it it can be it can seem so strange if you are not accustomed to that tradition but on the other hand it can seem so normal the weirdest things can seem absolutely normal and reasonable if you have grown up with that tradition and don't know any different. So I write down all of these traditions that my students share with me and I make a check mark or an X next to each of them depending on whether or not the student said, I actually can tell you the genesis of this tradition or the history of it. Um, or if they say, I have no idea, it's just that's what my mom is telling me to do. And then we start on the lottery. So the lottery is this really intense story. I say intense, but it's only intense at a, you know at certain moments, right? But it's this this story that um, is a horror story, and yet somehow, even though there are like these small clues that are dropped along the way, for the most part, it's quite a surprise at the end that you've been reading a horror story this whole time. And I would say the main reason for that is because Jackson very carefully and deliberately manipulates us as readers into thinking that this is anything but a horror story because she refuses to engage in the conventions that we associate the horror genre with. So let's think about how she's able to do this. There are a few ways. Um, think about what you associate. What sort of conventions or criteria do you associate with the horror genre? So my students say things like, well, of course, inclement weather, right? I mean, there's always like rain or a blizzard or a thunderstorm happening whenever like the most horrific moments are about to happen in a story or a film. Um, and yet, look what's happening in this story. When does this story take place? The morning of June 27th. And it's a clear and sunny day with the fresh warmth of the full summer. It's beautiful. We tend to think that, um, you know, the horror really happens at nighttime. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, the nighttime is when you are, your senses are perhaps not their keenest, right? Um, you, you can't see as well. You hear things, but you can't detect where they're coming from. Um, there are lots of, of noises that are surprising or shocking and, and because you can't, you can't derive the source of them, your imagination starts to run wild. Um, also, I mean, when you're in the dark, the unknown becomes a very great presence. And our imaginations, I think, run wild sometimes when we are so captivated by the unknown being right around us 
it's like this omnipresence that you can't get rid of until the daylight comes. Another convention of the horror genre is there are villains. And more often than not, the villain is very easily identified at the, I mean, right away. Um, not always, of course. So I'm, I'm speaking about all these conventions in very general terms. There are always exceptions. But I'm thinking of like the, you know, the very um, iconic villains of horror like Freddy Krueger or Jason. I mean, um, you know, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the, the villain in that one. I mean, we know they're villains. There's no question that, well, perhaps this is a good guy who's kind of just gotten off course for a minute, but there's redemption for him. Like there's, there's none of that, right? Um, these, these people are evil and terrible and absolutely terrifying and we want to stay away from them as much as possible. You know, they're clearly always after um, the protagonist and his or her group. Um, you know, they're they're loaded down with like chainsaws and axes and hockey masks and weapons. And I mean, it's very clear as day that they're the villain. Um, who is the villain in the lottery? I mean, that's, that's a question that we're going to talk about at length as we move on. But as you're reading it, you wouldn't say well, this, this citizen really seems like the villain here, right? They just, they're all quite normal people. In fact, think about the ways the characters are described. Um, I often tell my students that, you know, aside from, aside from the bludgeoning at the end, which I know is a very big um, moment in, in the story, these people kind of remind me of my grandparents. <clears throat> you know, um, this was written in the 1960s. And so you'll notice that in the story, the characters really um, are entrenched in those gender roles that were so um, part of culture in the 50s and um, in the 60s. So that means, of course, that women are expected to be domestic, right? They're cleaning the house, they're taking care of the children, um, they're you know, staying in their place, so to speak. Men, on the other hand, are out working so that they can bring in money to support the family. So you see these men who are talking about agriculture and taxes. Um, they're a little more, um, they've got a little more agency, it seems like, in the story. Um, the women, we are told they're just gossiping. Um, Tess actually even forgets, almost forgets, that today is the day of the lottery because she was doing a domestic chore, um, which, you know, isn't something that we would think would distract somebody from something this insane and crazy and serious. I mean, we know that Tess, Tess knows what she's getting into, right? She knows what's going to happen at the end of it. She doesn't know it's going to be that she's going to be the one who's chosen, but she certainly knows that somebody is going to be murdered. Um, and yet she was just doing her dishes and almost forgot what today was. But, you know, I ask my students, well, where would you, where would you identify what, like what sort of locale do you associate with this story and these characters, you know? And they always say, oh, like, a, you know, Iowa or Montana or Nebraska or like something very Midwestern, very, um, you know, where a lot of farmland exists, where small communities still exist. Um, nothing cosmopolitan, nothing, nothing really modern and big. And I sort of think of that too. I think this is probably in like Iowa or Ohio, just based on the people's personalities and, and the way that the community is run. Um, it just, these are like good old Americans. And I kind of imagine like there's apple pie that's probably sitting on the windowsill that you can smell. And, you know, um, everyone's kind of helping out on the farm. And, every, you know, clearly everybody knows everybody. Um, that's, I guess, a good thing in some ways. And it's not so, such a good thing in other ways. But, um, it just really seems like small town America and there's something really nice and wonderful about that to a point in this story. But the people seem very nice 
and they're they're laughing, they're greeting each other, they're smiling, they're um, you know, like I said, they're talking about just the weather and the taxes and the very mundane sorts of things. So in a horror story, one of the conventions that we often see are people that are, are terrified, they're scared, they're nervous, their hearts are beating, um, they're sweating because they're, they're so anxious, um, they're paranoid, they're worried, they're concerned, um, they're, they're scared. Look at the way that the people in the story are behaving. I mean, we really are told that they're exchanging gossip, they're laughing, they're a little cheerful, they're smiling with each other. There are moments of nervousness that can be detected, but those are few and far between when you're talking about sort of just how the general population is behaving. So that throws us off quite a bit, right? We've got these Midtown, like mid middle American people, they seem like our grandparents or our parents. They seem very kind. They seem communal. They seem to get along with one another. There seem to be friendships that have um, developed long ago and have been maintained. The weather is very beautiful. The grass is green. It's summer. Um, then we are told there's a lottery. And what do you think of when you hear the word lottery? I mean, this is the title, right? More often than not, when we think of the word lottery, we think of winning. We think of that's something that I want, right? So many people, um, you know, buy a ticket to win the lottery or put their name into the lottery and get that parking space that, you know, you need at the university or, um, you know, get your get your child into that, school that's you know closest to your house but there's a lottery for it because there are only so many spaces available like we we want to win the lottery so the title of the story is disarming as well and we think this must be a really good thing and i'm going to be rooting for whoever is going to you know we're going to be rooting for these people to win this lottery and obviously we know by the end of the story that the lottery is something that you absolutely do not want. Um, but in addition to just our, our natural associations with the word lottery, we are told that the lottery was conducted as were the square dances, the teen club, the Halloween club by Mr. Summers. So these are not only like just really fun activities that we associate, you know, good times with square dancing, teen clubs, Halloween programs. Sure, we all love those things, but we're also told that this was conducted by Mr. Summers who had time and energy to devote to civic activities. So this is a civic activity for the community. So I start to think, well, maybe this lottery is something that is going to help the community, right? Um, maybe they pull in all of their money and then it, all the money, whoever wins it, maybe like their their chosen um, charity or community need is met versus, you know, Joe over here who wanted something different for the community. There's a lot of trickery that's happening in this story, right? Now, as they're setting up this lottery, it becomes clear that this is a tradition that this community has been following and maintaining for many, many years. There are some communities out there who have done away with the tradition and we're not sure why, but we do know that Mr. Summers is adamant that this tradition keep going. And before we really know what this tradition is about, there's something really lovely in that to some extent, at least in the moment of reading it. Like he's keeping this small community alive. He's keeping the things that made this community alive. Um, and he is trying to not let them forget their past. We can maybe think that in that moment. Um, there are hints that this tradition began to help the crops. So uh, one person says, there used to be a saying, lottery in June, corn be heavy soon. 
And we do know that there were many pagan rituals and, and uh, other traditions amongst a variety of groups and cultures and societies that would, um, you know, give to God or their gods for good luck or good health or good crop, whatever they were needing that year. We can see the way that um, sacrifice is given in Genesis with the story of Cain and Abel. Um, whereas Cain gives his, uh, whereas Abel gives his absolute best to God, Cain does not. And there's been a lot of debate as to why God favors um, Abel over Cain. And many people have concluded that it is because there was not real sacrifice given um, by, by Cain. It's just one theory that people say. Um, and you'll notice too that in the lottery, there's one person who is not there, and it is a boy with a broken leg. And everyone is okay with him not being there. And it does seem to suggest that this is tied to the origins of the tradition. So whereas Cain, you know, whereas Abel is gonna give his best and Cain doesn't and God is very angry with that, there's no reason to have a boy with a broken leg here. He's not a good sacrifice. He is not the community's best right now. So we can interpret his absence to be um, um, very specifically part of the tradition. But the more that we are reading the story, the more you can continue to question why exactly they continue to hold this lottery. Um, it seems as though the community doesn't really believe in the superstition that if they perform this um, lottery and the sacrifice that the crops will be good. It's not for population control or for growth. I mean, you're only getting rid of one person a year, right? I'm assuming that more than one person is born in, in a year in this community. Doesn't seem to be for entertainment because nobody seems to enjoy it. In fact, everyone's really annoyed that they have to be there. So when I was talking about, you know, how would you expect um, a, you know, a protagonist in a horror film or a horror story to behave, they're like, they're certainly scared or they're nervous or anxious. These people aren't even really scared. Like I said, there are hints of nervousness, but ultimately they're annoyed. They want to get out of here. They've got things to do. Like they're kind of like tapping their foot, looking at their watch and thinking like, well, we, need, we need to get this going so that I can get back to my dishes. It's a very unusual way of um, reacting to something that they know is going to happen. So remember, you and I as readers, first time readers don't know what's going to happen, but everybody here does. Um, and it, it's pretty creepy after you read this the second, I mean, after you finish it, if you read it again, there are moments in the second reading that suddenly become very creepy or horrific, but they couldn't be horrific or creepy the first time around because we didn't have the knowledge that we now have that then renders those things very unsettling. And one thing that I'm thinking of here is, um, we're told that at the very beginning that the children assembled first. School was recently over for the summer and the feeling of liberty sat uneasily on most of them. They tended to gather together quietly for a while before they broke into boisterous play and their talk was still of the classroom and the teacher of books and reprimand. Bobby Martin had already stuffed his pockets full of stones and the other boys soon followed his example selecting the smoothest and roundest stones. So during a first reading, th that sounds very innocent and fun. This is the 60s. These are kids who are having to attend this communal event. Um, they don't have any toys. They're gonna make some toys out of rocks. They're just playing together, no harm done. That's what a lot of kids do. But on the, the second time that you read this, suddenly becomes a very creepy moment because you know 
that they're not just collecting stones to play, they are very carefully selecting stones with which to murder somebody. And they're picking out the best ones. Um, and they're not even thinking anything of it. And we are told that school is out and um, the feeling of liberty sat uneasily on most of them. So that's a creepy statement as well, right? Initially, we might think, well, it's because they've been in school for the last nine months and this is just sort of new to them. But it seems as though there's something to be said about the sort of control that the community has over each of its citizens. Um, so it's really fun to read through a story a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth time, you know, however many times you want to read it. And you'll find new things all the time because suddenly you have this knowledge that you didn't have the first time or even the second time sometimes. Um, and I think it's just one of the things I love so much about literature is, you know, these are not static and immutable um, stories. These are things that can be interpreted over and over again, and not just by, you know, you and me and that guy and this guy, but rather yourself, right? We change so much as we grow, um, and our life experiences will certainly impact the way that we read a story. Um, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a much different story when you're 20 versus when you're 50 and you lend those experiences or those feelings that you now have to those to the interpretation um, of a story that you're reading. And so I just think reading is an endless joy um, for, for me and I think for, for many people. So as the lottery is actually conducted, we still see more of those you know, codified gender roles that are expected amongst the men and the women. So you'll notice that this is a patriarchal society. The men represent the family. They are the ones who choose um, you know, the ballots to see who's going to be um, ultimately the victim or the quote unquote winner of the, the lottery. And Tess is ultimately chosen. And I'm curious how you feel about her protests. She says, oh, it's not right, it's not right. But yet there were no protests on her part as she was standing there chatting and gossiping and laughing with the other women. Um, do you think that she has a real, has real moral ground to make these protests? Or do you think she's simply saying it out of complete terror and fear, which I completely empathize with? I can understand why somebody would do that. Um, do you think she deserves it by being part of this community? Um, I know that's a very loaded question, but if she has agreed to these things, is this something that, and, and you don't have to be part of it, which we are not 100% sure how that works, does she, I mean, is this just part of what she signed up for? Um, but it's a really brutal and violent end where they all together just come at her, right? And murder her so, so um, maniacally. Now, we've been talking about the villain and who it is and what the real horror is. The real horror is not that this community killed this woman. That's certainly a horrific moment. But I think what Jackson is trying to get at here is that these are everyday average Americans. These are like my grandmother or my grandfather or your parents or your sister or you or me. It's all of us because none of these people questioned this very questionable tradition. And why should they, right? They have grown up with it. It's all they've ever known. It might be violent, but it's just how it's always been. It's been taught to them. It's been um, something that they're, you know, they're raising their kids on, that they were raised on. Now, the traditions that I mentioned to you, um, 
you know, that, and that my students have shared with me are certainly not as violent by any means. But Jackson doesn't care about that. She is demonstrating this sort of sheep mentality that humans are accustomed to fall prey to. We don't even think about it. So her point is, well, if you will just go run around the neighborhood with a suitcase and not even question it, and you just do it because that's what's always been done, or if you go and visit this six foot Easter bunny and you don't even think that's a little strange, we're clearly maybe programmed to follow any sort of tradition and not question it. Now, I don't think that Jackson is saying that traditions are bad. I think what she's saying is following a tradition with the, you know, the sheep mentality, never questioning it, never understanding what it means, what its significance is, why we do it. That's the real horror because community, friendship, family, goodness, morals, all of these things come at the expense of tradition in this story. There's not one person that protests on Tessa's behalf, not one person that advocates for her, not one person that questions it. Her son and her husband, and I believe she has a daughter, they're all um, bludgeoning her with a rock right now. So that maternal love, or excuse me, that, um, that, child, that child's love for their, for their mother or the husband's love for his wife comes at the expense of tradition and there's no questioning it. So that is the real horror, that it all, it, it lives and exists in all of us. Um, and it's a very scary thought that we are so easily um, able to fall prey to these kinds of things. And, you know, this, this can be expanded into a much larger, larger conversation on um, not just traditions, but life itself, you know, the, the variety of political conversations, cultural converse, conversations that are happening every single day, globally, locally. Um, are you just taking information and accepting it? Are you ever questioning it? Are you ever challenging it? Do you know why you believe what you believe? Is it simply because that politician told you that or because that instructor told you that? Or is it because you've researched it yourself, you understand it and you are making the decision to agree with that or disagree with that? So it's it's something to think about and it certainly is, is a concern and a concept that moves, you know, much further than than just this this one story, but I think the story does such a wonderful I, um, wonderful job of capturing this issue that really is problematic for each and every one of us, especially today, especially with the social media and the internet and the ways in which um, an opinion can be proliferated, you know, amongst millions and millions within seconds and sometimes never questioned. So let me know what you think about the lottery. Let me know if you were able to pick up on some of the horror um, conventions that um, were, were manipulated or um, that were sort of hinted at, but ultimately omitted. Let me know if you um, agree with the way that Jackson is arguing this concept. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, please subscribe to my channel. I'm going to be uploading videos on a variety of literary works. Um, I love to discuss them with other people. I love to hear your opinions and your ideas um, and how your own experiences have influenced the way that you interpret um, a canonical text. So thank you for joining me and I will see you guys next time. Bye.